Hey folks, Quilly King here and welcome to a brand new Let's Play for Stellaris. Also, man oh man, is this a great title screen or what? The um, the 3.7 or whatever patch that came with the first contact download and things, I think is when this uh, cutscene or title screen was introduced because it feels very first contacty. So gorgeous. Love the colors, the little bit of animation. Anyway, we're not here to look at art. We're here to blow some stuff up. So yes, I'm very excited. I've been looking forward to this uh, first contact, um, a little story pack for some time here. I think uh, I think it's a cool vibe for the game. I like how they've tweaked a few things into the game. It's nice that the, um, the primitives aren't um, nuking themselves every month anymore. So that, that was a good little hot fix after the fact. I actually have played a full game on my own here, this Maresh Star Lines, which because I wasn't doing a Let's Play, I just random the name because I was too uncreative to come up with something. I've done a full Let's Play of this on my own here with the Broken Shackles um, origin and had a great time playing this sort of Federation style, you know, the Free Haven with all the immigration, Idealist Foundation, lots of happiness, you know, egalitarian, xenophile. We were very politically minded. I actually just absolutely crushed and dominated this game uh, politically by the time the Endgame Crisis showed up, which I think was the, the Scourge, I guess, right? They sort of like up here in, in, a, in a handful of systems um, and then uh, and then start expanding out of there. I just instantly showed up with my god tier fleet, blew them up, occupied all the stuff and like got, you know, after after a little bit, got the pop up of, yeah, OK, I get they guess they've been defeated. Good job. It was the most easy game of Stellaris I'd ever played in the end, which um, says a lot about a diplomatic run. We are not going to do that kind of run today, though. We are going to be big jerk faces now. The story of the Broquillian effluvium actually begins from me talking in the uh, in the Discord, the um, the Twitch subscriber Discord channel that we have set up, um, about uh, a little like a plastic container, like a Tupperware container of some broccoli in my refrigerator. See, we'd been having a, a weird smell in the fridge, and we're trying to track down where it came from. There was a little Tupperware with some broccoli. Now it looked fine. From the outside, the broccoli looked like a perfectly good fresh green color. Everything seemed okay. We didn't think it had been in there that long. But um, I grabbed that out of the fridge, from the back of the fridge, and I opened it up, and I nearly immediately erupted, let's say, from the worst stench I have ever smelled in my entire life. It was so horrific. It's, it's simply indescribable. It was so bad. And I was talking about this in the Discord. And from that discussion came this race that we built for Stellaris. Um, so I can't take credit for the idea of deciding to make the broccoli people into a race. But this is what I ended up making from all that discussion in the end. The broccoli effluvium who live in the fridge. So let's talk about this race over here and uh, go through things. First of all, appearance. Yep, we're going to go plantoid because that makes a lot of sense. Mm hmm. Name list. I'm just going with plantoid too. Traits. Now we're going to ignore Cave Dweller for a sec and come back to it. The trait picks we've got over here were not meant to be optimized. These traits are meant to tell the story of this horrible, horrible broccoli. So we've got the inorganic breath over here, which I mean, I guess is nice because of the exotic gases. The plus 50% upkeep is actually pretty rough. We do tend to, whenever I play one of the races with one of these modifiers that was added in, I can't remember what DLC added that. I'm not sure, um, but I always tend to have a little bit of a problem with uh, consumer goods. Also, like it's a three point pick. It's very expensive. This will make it quite easy for us to run the high level laboratories later, which do have an upkeep of exotic gases, as well as some of the ship parts and things like that. But again, mostly I'm picking up for story purposes. Uh, I don't think it's like I don't think that's a min maxi kind of trait. We are going to be repugnant, which makes a lot of sense. We get reduced amenities from jobs, but it does give us two of our points back, which is good. We're also going to take fleeting here because apparently we decay quicker than expected, even if we're in the back of the refrigerator. Um, I actually don't tend to like this trait. I mean, maybe it's actually one that a lot of people use. Maybe it doesn't impact too much, but I actually like to take the inverted trait, the one that increased lifetime of my leaders, because I really like to have the leaders hit their maximum experience cap and stay there for as long as possible, because I think that's quite strong. In fact, a lot of times when we're playing, I will pick the, um, um, what are they called? 
Ascension perk. There's an Ascension perk that I think gives you like more leader levels. And there's been a few play, a few games where one of the goals is to make sure my leader experience cap is level 10 and that my leaders stay there as long as possible. Because I think that's actually really good. So fleeting is going to be kind of the opposite of that, but uh, I don't think it's going to hurt us too much. What's actually going to hurt us the most is noxious. Now, again, from the theme that I'm trying to create, noxious makes perfect sense. But even though this is a trait that costs pick points, I think it's mostly like, it's mostly bad. You have, you have to come up with a really um, specialized um, uh, species in maybe three different ways that allow you to take advantage of noxious. So let's look through what it, it gives us. It increases the minimum hat ability by 30%, which means even on a tomb world, unless I'm lying, I'm hoping not lying, even on a tomb world, which would normally have 0% habitability or um, whatever world's the furthest away from the habitability of your species, which I think would normally have 20% habitability. This race with Noxious always has a minimum of 30%, which is fine, although 30% habitability is pretty crap anyway. So that part do doesn't seem to matter that much. On the flip side, they have minus 30% to the habitability cap, which means that whatever their habitability was supposed to be, it's 30% less than that. With, again, there's still that minimum of 30, and that's a hard minimum. We can't go below that 30%. So for example, if the planet we're trying to colonize was going to be 40% habitability, we get 40% minus 30%, which should bring us to 10%, but then it keeps the floor at 30. Uh, but it also means that if we find another Arctic world, so um, your home world normally gives you 100% habitability, except for us, we're gonna be starting at 70%. And planets of your home world type normally give you 80% habitability, but that would only be 50% for us. Noxious is terrible really bad now yeah it gives you extra army band image but i don't think that's that important it actually increases your pop housing usage which is terrible um it makes non-noxious pops that share your planet miserable on the other hand you do get happier if you have non-noxious pops living on your planet basically the broquillion here are happy when they get to stink up in other people's faces now, that opens up the first example of how you might synergize this trait. If you play the species as a very aggressive slaving species, maybe you're taking barbaric despoilers, for example, to even pick up more, you know, and you're just loading up your planet with pops that you don't care about the, those pops happiness in any way whatsoever, but it would actually make your Boquillians happy because they'd be making other people's lives miserable. So that's one way that you can kind of work noxious um, and using it as a way to generate bonus happiness for your primary species. I don't think we're going to do that today. Uh, I did take communal over here because they're used to being packed in tight in a Tupperware container or, you know, other brands are available. Technically, I think my plastic container is a Ziploc brand. You know, Tupperware is almost, almost genericized. Um, so, yeah, we've got that. But mostly it's to counter the increased pop housing from Noxious, uh, which doesn't even make it that appealing. Yeah, and we'll come back to Cave Dweller in just a scooch. Our home world is the fridge. Uh, our star is the light that never goes out, even when the door is closed. Um, we are picking Frozen as our base type, which doesn't matter, mostly just because, you know, it's a refrigerator. It should be chilly. I suppose that makes kind of sense. Uh, city appearance. I want Plantoid. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, let's talk about origin. So. I was very excited for the first contact expansion, which adds, I believe, all three of these origins over here. Payback, Broken Shackles, and Fear of the Dark. And all these seem really quite interesting. And again, I did do my um, my personal offline playthrough uh, with Broken Shackles, which is great, great, great fun. Um, I'm quite curious about what Fear of the Dark does, um, but I'm not picking it because instead we are going to be picking Subterranean. And the reason is this is one of the other ways to make Noxious not be crap. The other way is to focus on um, Gaian worlds because Gaian worlds, as well as the world type that I can never pronounce, Ecumenopolis or whatever, I believe they um, they don't actually do normal habitability math. They are just hard coded at a fixed 100%. Uh, so I think what happens is whatever function call the game calls to say, hey, this species on this planet, what's its habitability at? I think it's just got a thing at the top that probably says if planet type equals Gaian or Ecunimabalis, um, return 100% just period. Um, so one of the things we could done, and I did consider doing that, uh, but I didn't think it fit thematically, is isn't it doesn't start with an i oh maybe it's not allowed currently because of my picks yeah idyllic bloom over here 
Um, oh yeah, it conflicts with Relentus Industrialist, then, which makes perfect sense. Um, this is something you can pick if you're a fungoid or a plantoid, and it lets you build buildings that will terraform the planets to Gaian quite early on. Or you could go into your Ascension perks and get the, the Gaian terraforming or whatever, because um, presumably if you go Gaian, you get to bypass the um, minus 30% habitability cap of being noxious. But I didn't think thematically it fit what we were doing here very much. So instead we're taking the, the third option. So again, slavery is one way that you can uh, min max around noxious. Gaian is another one. In fact, combining um, the slavery thing with Gaian would work because your slave species then habitability would be in a, a, a fine uh, um, place. But we're gonna go subterranean instead. This was one of the reasons I'm not caring about going um, with the slave species route because the slave species won't actually benefit from subterranean. So what this does is it gives us all of our starting species the cave dweller trait, which we'll take a look at in a second. And that is actually the big one. Um, what else does it do? Mining districts are uncapped, so we can always build mining districts up to the F, the, the district cap of the planet, right? Instead of however many it rolled, um, if a planet allows 12 districts, we could make 12 mining districts on that planet regardless. Mining districts also give us additional housing um, and every three mining districts give us one building slot. So we can build a crap ton of mining districts, whether or not we really take, you know, whether or not we really focus on that, I don't know, it's gonna be convenient, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a nice little bonus. Um, and then also your species constructs cities on the ground giving the following benefits. Actually, a lot of these are penalties. It's more expensive to build buildings. Um, they are more expensive to upkeep and they build slower on the ground. They do have a resistance to bombardment. Oh, this combos so well with the, um, the technology that I love so much that gives you the bombardment shield because I always feel that that's a really valuable thing to focus on. <clears throat> so, you know, kind of disadvantages over here. But the big thing with subterranean is the fact that our species starts with a cave dweller trait. So if we go back over to our traits and mouse over cave dweller, this is where the combo with noxious comes in. This gives us with cave dweller, a species minimum habitability of plus 50%, which means if you're normally a cave dweller, no planet can be worse than 50% habitability. And this does stack with the 30% from noxious, which sets the minimum habitability of all of our planets to 80%. Now, because we've got the minus 30% habitability cap, it will, it will never be higher than 80%. Every single planet we ever find will have 80% habitability for our species, which is pretty good, actually. All of a sudden, that's actually a pretty strong combo. Uh, Cave Dweller also makes it so that our minerals, our, our pops generate more minerals, which I guess means we actually will need fewer mining districts than normal, so. We don't necessarily need it to be on cap, but sure, I mean, that's fine. Um, our empire size from pops is actually more substantial and our growth speed is reduced. That is pretty bad. The negative growth speed is pretty bad, but having 80% habitability everywhere is pretty sick. So we're gonna do that as far as I know, and I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure this will also work on two worlds, which is very relevant if we go back to our government ethics over here, because I have picked Relentless Industrialist as one of our civics. Uh, this lets us build coordinated fulfillment centers, which increases alloy and consumer goods output of the planet. It further reduces pop growth, which I don't love, but let's see what we can do. Hopefully, maybe we'll do some genetics later to um, increase our species based pop growth. That's probably a good idea. Um, it also gradually turns planets into tomb worlds. Again, I don't think we care. I think we won't care if it, a planet becomes a tomb world. I think um, we'll still be at 80% habitability. Again, it'll make it so that other species can't really live there, which is one of the reasons I am going xenophobe here, just because it gives us the option of purging aliens. And I think we will be purging aliens. We might displace them. We might eradicate them. I don't know. But I think our empire is going to be just our Brockwillians, mostly because the other species really wouldn't be happy in our empire regardless. Uh, we're also taking militarists because again, we're all about like being as offensive and in people's faces as possible. Um, I decided to put a point into materialist over here because, oh, materialist was required for relentless industrialist. We needed at least one level of this. Also, robots don't care about habitability, so they will actually work pretty well on our planets. Although. Ironically, we'd like our own people to do the mining if at all possible, but the robots would be fine farmers. I don't know if a planet becomes a tomb world. If a planet becomes a tomb world, does it lose its farming districts? Like, I know a lot of the tomb worlds you find out there have kind of crap districts, but I don't know if you lose the districts. 
But that's okay, because what we can do, if we find, like, we only need one, maybe two strong farming worlds in your empire. I mean, depends on your size, obviously. But we just, we simply won't build a coordinated fulfillment center on our, our farming planets, if we're not sure. And once one of the planets becomes a tomb world, we can check to see if it lost its farming districts or not, or maybe gets a penalty to farming, in which case, you know, we can decide whether we can add this everywhere. But, I mean, really, this only needs to be added to our are factory worlds. The factory worlds, forge worlds, or industrial worlds, you know, depending on the specialization. Um, I think that's it. So yeah, origin, advisor voice is gonna be xenophobe, sure. Empire name is the Broquillian Effluvium. Our flag, I think, looks pr properly gross, which I liked. We're gonna go with the plantoid ships. And a ruler, I think I just set this as random. We got flower of bow. All right. So we are gonna play with this. Hey, we are 15 minutes in, almost ready to actually start the game. Wow, what a speed run. Um, I believe right here we'll do we'll do a reset to default over here. Uh, I will go large for the galaxy. Um, I think I'm gonna go with no advanced AI starts. I really like the even footing. Sometimes I like it in there for story. I think here we're gonna go even footing. I will increase the AI count to maybe 60. We'll have it be a little bit more crowded. I think that's fine. Fallen empires are okay. Marauders are cool. I think I'm gonna leave the costs normal. The habitable world's normal. Sometimes I like putting this way down, but I think we'll we'll leave it mostly normal this time around random um the crisis starts i'm wondering about pushing these forward just a little bit Hang on a sec. When, I ch did, when i changed the end game did it change the end year no but the slider does like work oddly all of a sudden huh interesting Okay, yeah, so I'll just pull back the end game uh, start by 25 years and the victory year by 25 years as well. Um, I'm tempted to go like quite a bit earlier, but that might not actually give us enough time to defeat the crisis. So we'll do that. Um, difficulty, we are going to go Grand Admiral, but we're going to scale to late game over here. So the enemies will get to their full bonuses once we get to the late game year over here, which is a little sooner. So it is going to happen kind of quick, but that's all right. Um, let's keep this the same, keep this the same. That's the same hyper lighting density. Sometimes I like going quite low on this. I think I'll leave it the default. Same thing with game uh, gateways and wormholes. Guaranteed habitable worlds. We'll leave it here. Mostly this is going to be for the AI because we actually are going to be pretty open to habitable worlds. We don't need to find Arctic worlds, um, but we'll leave it on there. Um, Caravaneers, I don't tend to interact with that often. I mostly turn this off for the pop-ups. I don't know if Xeno compatibility still leads to late game performance issues or not, but I'm not planning on using Xeno compatibility, so I'm gonna turn this off regardless and leave everything else the same. All right, let's play. Oh, baby. Nearly 18 minutes into this video, we're gonna start the game. There's the Broquillin of uh, Effluvium. Um, oh, I forgot to talk about the other <laughs> <laughs> the other government pick over here, Eager Explorers. We're going to start the game with a technological and infrastructural disadvantage and 10 fewer pops than normal. Keeping in mind, we even have a reduced pop growth rate. So this is going to be really, really harsh. Also, our starting vehicles are kind of weird because we don't have hyperdrives. So we have some jump drives on our not construction ships, but exploration or engineering vessels and not science ships, but exploration vessels. So engineering and exploration vessels that have jump. On the other hand, we do get um, a bonus to sublight speed, which is nice and uh, survey speed and only discovery chance, which I like quite a bit. Let's take a look at our surroundings. Okay, so we're on kind of the outer rim of the galaxy here, which is going to limit our expansion sort of on one side. But at the same time, we don't really have to worry about threats on the side. So there's pros and cons. Uh, one thing that's interesting, if I try to put auto explore or auto survey on our exploration ships and just unpause for a sec, they so say they should cancel that because they shouldn't actually be able to do it because of the jump drive. So our ships can't use the hyperspace lanes. They instead have to jump and they do have a 200 day cooldown as for normal one. Okay, I'm going to manually move you over there. I think this guy will auto cancel or at least just not do anything. My engineering vessel, before we look at the planet, we're just gonna go and tell you, yeah, we'll be automating you later. Actually, again, we can't, as far as I know, because of the jump drives, uh, kind of make the automation not work. Although I think if I turn this on, it will improve the current system, but I'm gonna manually make sure that it boosts our um, mineral um, production over here, if at all possible. Let's take a look at the fridge and see what our situation is here. Well, already, yeah, negative amenities, um, but we also, we don't have the normal buildings, right? Oh, are we starting with a coordinated fulfillment center? 
Okay. That's interesting. I don't have enough money to remove any features right now. I will try. I'll probably forget, but hopefully when we get to 300 credits, I'll remove to remember to remove the sprawling slums, slums for plus one pop. Um. Yeah, I don't know if this is. Oh, yeah, it is different because I think normally you'd start with a, um, a research lab, right? But we don't have a, the ability to build research labs. We just don't have that tech right now. So speaking of tech, let's take a quick look at that. So uh, research labs unlocking early might be priority. The other thing though is hyperdrives so that we can build conventional science ships and whatnot. Um, I think it is gonna be important for us to get a research lab ASAP. So I'm gonna do that. And I mean, the other thing we could do is uh, what I'd normally go is like physics research from researchers or something like that, but we don't have researchers. So we need the research lab first. Uh, pop growth speed. We could also go and get planetary government for the planetary administration, precinct offices, administrative offices. Although our capital does have a planetary administration and administrative office. I think what we're going to do is take the growth speed immediately. Again, I'd often be tempted to take the science, but I think we need to get the growth speed. Look at these research times. Just ridiculous. And then we don't even start with the Corvette technology here. Again, it's our, um, our, Eager Explorers is very similar to the pre-FTL Origins, in which we don't start with this. So I guess we'll research Corvettes because Afterburners doesn't do anything for us. We don't have anything to install them in. And we don't yet have any researchers. So yeah, we may as well do that. But yeah, we need to improve our science rate as soon as we can. Uh, what'll likely happen in our capital here. So you produce trade values and amenities, but I'm thinking about canceling or disabling the commercial zone just to make sure people go to work in some of the basic things. We've already got negative food. Okay, you're in mixed economy, that's good. Expansionist, indiscriminate bombardment. Aggressive for, uh, well, we'll get a pop up for it, but I guess aggressive is going to be, I don't know if aggressive is necessarily that strong, but it sounds like fun. So we're going to do that. Close borders, sure. Actually, here's the thing. I'm kind of fine with, um, with people walking through our borders because then they get to smell our smells. And being that kind of troll, I think is very appealing to us. So yeah, I can build more exploration vessels and engineering vessels, but it would be the ones with uh, no hyperdrive. They are cheap but I think we'll, we'll go ahead and wait. Okay, let's unpause over here. Ah, there you go. I knew that was gonna come. Fleet door is canceled. Auto explore is just not an option. So we're gonna have to manually, like the olden days, manually queue up some uh, some surveying here. The reason auto explore isn't working is because the jump drives have cooldowns and stuff. It just wouldn't work quite right. So yeah, we'll do that. We've got some planets here. Ooh, size 25 desert world? That's really... Hang on, is there a Leviathan in this system? with the size 25 desert world? Uh, I don't see it. Probably just missed it though. All right, so news and encounter with deep space construct of gar- Oh, construct. Gargantuan proportions spreading through the Broquillian effluvium. While entity does not appear to be a biological nature, its mere presence has inescapable ramifications, possibility of technology and mega engineering. Imagine what it could teach us. Imagine how impressive a trophy it could be. I don't think either one of these do anything currently. Did we did we find a mega construction? I don't see an icon about it. First contact profiles, yes. We will go and set to aggressive. We can do kidnapping stuff and things, which I don't think is uh, brilliant, generally speaking. Anomaly found. Okay, we're gonna leave this anomaly because the research time is a little on the long side currently. We'll see if we can get one of our scientists to level twos before we do that. Okay, I'm still a little unsure about what construct we just found, but I'm gonna bring the speed up to two. It's probably right in front of my face, but I'm not seeing it. Construction complete. Uh, mining station done, good. I'm gonna get you to do the other mining station that's level five. Oh, you can't do it yet. All right, well, just chill over here then. That's gonna have to be okay. Um, wow, yeah, negative money. I mean, barely, but technically yes. Negative food. We are going to run into consumer goods shortages pretty quickly. I should probably just cancel the bureaucrats for now. Although, 
the sooner we can get a policy is good. Because, like, we have nine empty jobs, so we could go and move things around. I could, rather than just disable a building, although it would save money, I could prioritize something. Yeah, we don't have maxed out farmers, but that's fine. Oh, yeah, we don't even have clerks working, so you know what? And these are clerk jobs, right? Yeah, I'm just going to disable this building so that we're not paying upkeep on it. Because we're right now we're playing two credits per month, and it's not even employing anyone. Let's do that. I mean, we still have clerks working in these city districts. Can I? I mean, I guess I could decrease job priority. So it's minimal priority, so it doesn't actually close the building. So if we do get unemployed people, they will go there. Although it looks like the slots are just closed. But let me do this for now. If they're going to go anywhere, I think we really will want them to prioritize the other buildings. Not usually having to, like, min-max that kind of stuff at the start of the game, but I think now is okay. So I don't think anyone moved, because no one was working as clerks yet. But we are going to save some money by not having the commercial zone up. Okay, and we're going to leave that for a little bit. We're obviously going to go and um, claim these two systems quite quickly, so we're going to want to do these anomalies. But right now, I'm more eager to have them do serving. If they finish serving and their jump cooldown's not up, then maybe we'll start on that or completed at that point, but I think it's going to take them 200 days to do full surveys over here. So most likely those cooldowns will be up. Do I have enough minerals? Oh, I do. So do that immediately. And yeah, we're still not gaining credits. The Grunner. Uncovered remains ancient space bearing feces of Grunner. Three people. It's okay, but it's... It's the... Bowel tree people that give you Gaia and terraforming, right? Am I getting confused? The Grunner. I don't know what they give you. Because if they... Hmm. All right, dig site, exploration vessel. Yeah, you've done that. Um, but yeah, I'm assuming... Now, here's the thing. We don't have to go one at a time. I could jump and skip systems. I don't think there's any reason to do that right now. We kind of want to have, like, contiguous systems... Um, Sorted. Okay, report, a, report on alien remnants. Question remains that are now widely considered to be definitive proof of unknown forces having once having been active in the galaxy. Though some prominent Barquillian thinkers reject this in favor of identifying the traces as freak geological formations or results of curious natural phenomena. I do like the idea of like people denying the existence of aliens in this game. It's pretty funny. <laughs> Finish that, and then I might automate you due to the rest. Construction complete. Yeah. All right, let's do that. Eventually, I will have to turn this off, because I don't think they'll jump from system to system to do this. Uh, yeah, Habitable World Survey is fine. We get a decent amount of social uh, society research from completing that. And right now, we could use a boost to it. Although, I think the amount you get from events is scaled based on the amount you're generating. So until we generate any, we are going to be in kind system of a rough survey spot. Complete. Okay, surveys are complete over here. Let's just jump to the next system. But we've got some stuff we can colonize quite early on, including a big world here. Any traits on these planets? Oh, yeah. Construction complete. All right. So, yeah, I'm going to be spending my minerals, which are coming in quite quickly. We're going to be spending that on space stuff rather than planet stuff. But again, our growth is so, it's so bad. Wait, is it literally not growing? Oh, no, that's immigration. Yeah, oh, there we go. Planet habitability. Yeah, because it's not 100%, so it's slower. Cave dwellers. Oof. Construction complete. Oh, another archaeological site right over here. Okay. All right, traditions available. So, the two traditions I do like the best. Oh, worth noting, the, uh, the offline game I played, I think I started with, like, diplomacy right away. Just to, like, force myself to be different. Or maybe it was Harmony. I can't remember what it was. Um, for us, now, habitability is not bad. Um, or adaptability is not bad. But one of the things it does give you is plus 10% habitability, which I, I think we need to stack so many habitability modifiers to overcome our minus 30% that's built in as a cap. And then again, it's, I don't think we're going to care about habitability modifiers. So I don't think we go down adaptability, although it is a very strong tree. But of course, the two that are quite sexy early on are discovery and expansion. Um, and oftentimes, if I start with expansion, sometimes I don't bother with discovery after that. Obviously, we are going to be expanding quite a lot because we are going to be having a pretty easy time finding new colonies to settle. And the growth speed... 
Um, I'm just trying to decide if I might still want Discovery first. The Map of the Stars Edict is actually pretty sexy. Boldly goes great. I guess these don't increase the chance of finding anomalies anymore, right? One of these, I think Boldly Go used to give you maybe an increased chance to find anomalies, which is why I really like this, because anomalies can lead to pretty substantial permanent bonuses. I think we're going to go straight into expansion. I think we're just going to go ahead and do that. Because, yeah, we are going to be dropping a lot of colonies fairly early on, so getting a kickstart on that is going to be great. Now, the big problem is we are going to be quite behind in our development, right? Because, I mean, we don't start a fleet, we don't start with the tech for it, Buildings are a little harder um, just because of our origin, right? The eager explorers. It's basically your your pre-FTL start, although we do have FTL because we have junk, but very similar to that. Oh, you're mindful and meticulous. Wow. I hope you live for a long time. Do they? Oh, I forgot to change the prefix because I always do. So we're ISS. Both of our ships are called Evergreener, which is kind of funny. All right, that's fine. Well, they're both quite good at, at serving. So serving quickly slash finding um, more stuff is quite good. Um, so all the more incentive for these scientists to not spend time doing anomalies, but instead actually go and survey. Because, like, this person's not better at doing anomalies. They're just better at finding them. So we want them to System find as many as possible. Complete. Okay, and you're done there. I'm going to keep sort of going out in a straight line to figure out where our choke points are. Because all this area, this area over here, there's no extra connections. Same thing over here, no extra connections. So all this is stuff I can just grab at my leisure. Complete. All right, are you still, yeah, you are still building mining stations. Okay. Still don't have enough money to clear that blockage. We still haven't grown our population on our planet. Oof. Yeah, we're going to need uh, gene clinics. Uh, although, so gene clinics do increase your pop growth, but... What we're really going to need is robots, actually. Uh, but one of the things they do later in the game and makes them kind of more worthwhile compared to how they were kind of originally is that they do improve um, habitability, habitability later, but we don't actually care about that. Okay, 180 days. Tell you what, go ahead and do that research. It's not too bad. Construction complete. Okay. Oh, this, this engineering ship still has things to do. They get the extra energy credits. All right, we got positive numbers across the board. Toxic terraforming can be discovered. So despite our traits, I think we still can't settle a toxic planet. I think we still have to terraform it to one of the normal planet types. System um, I think toxic terraforming is an ascension perk, right? Uh, society management. Detox. Which, depending on how many of these planets might be worth doing, it might be less important in a sense, because I think we're going to be settling lots of planets. But at the same time, more is better. Okay, you're done here. So this is going to be dead end. So yeah, just keep pushing straight out in a straight line. Downside is the sooner we do this, the sooner we meet people who we're probably not going to have great relations with, but we still need to know what's what. Okay, this construction ship is now done. And I mean, I mean, it wouldn't have anything else to be automated with normally, but... Even if there were things that it could be automatically constructing, it wouldn't it wouldn't do the jump autonomously here. Let's go to Markaz first because it's got two habitable worlds and that size 25 in particular. Ah, don't count your plant. What system is this in? Tiamat. Okay. Yep. Good. Good name for this. Scientists have covered something rather monstrous. The mountain range they scanned earlier was actually the outer membrane of a gigantic egg. It's uncertain what behemoth could lay such an egg and what horrors would hatch from it. And study from afar, gaining a permanent sign boost here. We could also crack it open. Um, I don't remember. If this doesn't give us like a pet, does it? I like the idea of cracking it open because it sounds more violent and more what we do. I can't remember what it does. This isn't how we get bubbles, though, is it? It might be. I guess I'm curious. I guess I'm going to do this. Although, if it summons a space monster here that would block our expansion, that would be quite poor. You know what? 
I know it's probably the least fun option. I don't remember what it does. I really don't want this to be blocked. I mean, we can use jumps to skip this, but ultimately we can just use jumps to skip it. Because presumably from Gay here, we could jump across to at least whatever this system is. And then our construction ship could then eventually jump to here and then claim that we'd be paying a influence premium because it's not adjacent, but it would work. All right, crack it open. Updated. It is going to use the science ship. Let me just queue up a uh, research project in the system. There we go. <laughs> All right, you come in over here claiming that. Um, I mean, I guess in theory, I could have waited until we got right here to save some starbase influence, but no, I think I think we've got to at least start one up over here. Anomaly found. That's a cheap anomaly. Debris in orbit around the gas giant. Oh, lost starships. Okay. System survey complete. There, so again, that's locked in, so we'll just keep pushing in a straight line. Normally I would want more um, more science ships here, but because we can't just kind of automate them and everything, I'm not going to bother. Okay, you're going to hook that up. Can we colonize now? No, I think we need 200 food for a colony ship, right? Yeah. 200 food. Can I just buy it? We've got positive energy now. I mean, I kind of want the 300 energy to be able to clear the one blocker on the fridge. But I think it makes sense for us to colonize sooner rather than later. Now, how come there's not two colonizable worlds? Oh, because it has an anomaly. Okay. Fair, 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 fair. But yeah, let's do this desert world here. We're going to rename these later, but once we kind of figure out what the purpose of these planets were, I will try to give them names, which will make it easier for me to keep track of things. Oh, I forgot to address um, the mods. Well, mostly mods singular uh, that I'm running. I'm running Tiny Outliner over here, along with the Tiny Fleet submod. It just makes the outliner more compact, um, and I really, really like it a lot. Um, that's all we're running. Nothing that changes any other user interface. I considered the uh, the mods that give you um, that uh, make the UI for these screens scalable and things, but I'm fine with the basic screens for these these things. I don't need them to be bigger, but I, I really want the outliner to have this more compact view. So I'm running the tiny outliner mod along with the tiny fleet sub mod for it that uh, just works together and uh, I think is lovely. Anyway, we are, uh, well, 37 minutes into this episode. Let's go ahead and put a cut in here. I'm very excited for this playthrough. I don't think it's going to be easy. Again, I mean, it's the start, especially that's going to be tough. Um, even with the scaling difficulty the way it is, it's the start because we're so delayed um, with because of the background we took. So right, less tech, fewer people and our people grow slower. It's going to be really tricky. We it's entirely possible we might be forced to bend the knee to someone early on. Hopefully not, but it's entirely possible. Uh, that we may have to do that to avoid direction. We'll see. Thanks a lot for watching this episode, folks. If you are new to the channel, of course, subscribe. And in general, you know, the like, comment, all those sorts of things are really good for the, the Yubtub metrics. I'll see you in the next episode. Bye-bye.